What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to Civic Minded. Today, Zach and I are doing, to his 2014 Honda Civic Si, a mod that I think has been one of the most asked about on the forums, or, or discussed, even. And that is conversion from the manual climate control that the US SIs came with to automatic. We're going to be discussing what is needed to make this happen and how to do it. Um, so, both the automatic and manual climate control have this 32-pin connector in the back. They do not have the same pin out, and they are not directly interchangeable with each other. So in order to make this automatic work with the manual plug, you've got to do a couple translations, and that's what this little black box is for. This is a little custom circuit that will plug into the manual climate control here, and then come out and plug into the automatic. And I will show you guys how to make the box, how to make the circuit, and in a separate video, I'm going to just discuss kind of how the circuit works. The short version is the automatic climate control adds a couple of sensors and connections that the manual climate control does not have. Uh, mainly, it adds the CAN bus, which, if you guys remember, that's the network that all body components on the car use to communicate with each other. So you guys probably remember when I did rain sensor on my car. Uh, Zach's has done the rain sensor on his car. It's the exact same bus. And if you've done the rain sensor mod, you'll just be able to tee off and plug in here. But even if you haven't, it's very easy to tee off, and we'll discuss that all later in the video. We also need to add an inter interior temperature sensor, and that's this right here, and this one is actually missing side paneling, so we'll be sure to, clo we'll be sure to close that off. But the interior temperature sensor is, if you're like me and you got it, a whole unit here, it's built into the side of the climate control. And that simply plugs into the back, which we've got an adapter for here. Very easy. And it also adds a connection to the automatic sunlight sensor. So if you're like Zach and you have the SI, you already have automatic headlights, so you'll just need to wire this into your sunlight sensor. But even if you don't, you can pick up a sunlight sensor probably where you got your climate control unit, assuming you bought it used, because they're not exactly cheap new. Uh, you can pick up a sunlight sensor and connect to that, and that's going to connect to this box as well. I'll give a more detailed explanation of what translates to what in a different video. But for now, for this video, we're going to show you... I'm going to show you how to build this device, how to build the PCB, how to solder the components to it, and uh, which connectors you need to build. And this device is just plug and play, so you'll be able to plug this into your cli manual climate control harness, and plug this end into your automatic climate control. Just like that, very easy. Make all the necessary connections, and then Zach is going to show you how to actually install it in the car. So we'll start by ordering the PCB. Uh, there are a lot of services that will do this. This one is probably my favorite, JLC PCB. Great price, great minimums, great... I've, I've had very good very good experiences with these guys, and I've been using them for a couple of years now. So, so yeah, that would be my recommendation. But if you've got a preferred PCB service, if you've ever made PCBs before, feel free to use that. Uh, for these guys, you just have to add Gerber file, and this file will be provided here. Gerber is essentially a map for the PCB fabricator to create the board. All you gotta do is upload it. They will take you to this page. And boom, look at that. They got the board all in and uh, you can basically add it to your cart and order it. One thing I would recommend before doing that if you're gonna use JLC is this option down here, surface finish. You're gonna wanna select lead free HASL just so you don't contaminate your soldering iron with lead, so you don't use lead at all, because, as we all know, lead is toxic. Additionally, if you don't want to solder the components yourself, which you don't have to, you can scroll down here and uh, enable PCB assembly. I would say do standard, because there are components on both sides of this. Well, there are not a lot of components on the bottom, but there still are some components on the bottom. And then when you go ahead and place, it's a little bit more expensive, but when you go ahead and place your order, uh, you're going to want to upload. You know, next, you're going to want to upload two files that I will also provide here, and that is not for this project, but you're going to need to upload the bill of materials, which is this right here. And then you're going to need to upload the pick and place file, which is this right here. Say process. And you'll see they've got see they've got a list of parts here. Some of these they weren't able to find. I think their stock varies over time. Um, let me know if that happens. You can always skip those and solder those yourself, which I will be providing instructions for that. But you'll just go next, just say do not place. And they will generate a preview of the PCB with part placement. 
You can even go 3D if you want. Go next again. And then you'll just go ahead and save to cart. And yeah, the price is kind of high for that, but uh, yeah, if you don't want to have to solder it yourself, this is an option. So yeah. If you are soldering yourself, you're going to need to order parts. And uh, I always order my parts from the site called DigiKey. The shipping is very fast. They, uh, they have basically everything we need. Uh, low minimums, good prices. They're perfect. So uh, presumably you don't have an account with them. If you do, you can go ahead and create a new cart. But if you don't, you're going to want to go ahead and select the empty shopping cart. Select view cart. And you'll get and you'll come to this screen that says your shopping cart is empty. So instead of having to enter part numbers in one at a time, you can actually bulk add a parts list. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Just get this bulk order file here, which I will provide. You'll see that. So uh, quantity, digikey part number, add to new cart, and you may get an error that some of the parts were not available like this one. Uh, so if that happens, you can click set price break here, and you see this one here, it uh, has a minimum we didn't meet, so <laughs> a very cheap minimum at that. But let me know if there's any... Of, some of these are pretty easy. Sometimes you just have to select the alternate part or select an alternate part. Uh, there's, they're usually linked below. If you can't figure any them out, just let me know and I'll adjust the file as needed. But you can go ahead and click Submit and place the order like any other online order. So now I'll show you how to prepare the 3D print file if you're doing that yourself. So the CAD files I provided are the generic universal STL files. They're 3D models essentially, and they're designed to be loaded into software like this to be sent to the 3D printer. So we load this in. This is going to generate a set of instructions specific to the Polyprinter 229. This is going to vary a bit from printer to printer, but it's, it's the same general procedure, so you should be able to figure it out if you haven't done it before. So uh, I would recommend that you check your profile settings first and make sure that... What the hell? Ah, whoa. <laughs> make sure you can actually click and drag... Really? Ah, stupid virtual machine. Okay, I'll have to show you down here, but, but uh, you're going to want to make sure that you have your material set to ABS, because... You don't want to print this in PLA because that will melt in a hot car. Uh, for support, you're going to want to make sure it's just just normal support should be fine. Uh, infill, which is under style, 33% should be fine. This doesn't need to withstand a heavy load, so the default settings for ABS should be good, regardless of what printer you have. So I'm just going to click open, load in. There are two STL files, one for the bottom, one for the top. They get loaded in the same way. So we get the bottom that's loading in like that. Very easy, and then we can simply load in the top with the same procedure. Oh, and uh, you don't want to print it like this because it's just going to waste filament. It's going to be generating support materials. So, so for the Polyprinter 229, you're going to want to come to the list of imported models on the right here, right click and select Transform Mesh flip upside down and that will make it so that it's printing open up so there's a, there's no support material to be generated then from here you want to click slice it'll take a couple of minutes to figure out what the uh, printer moves need to be but this is all totally normal regardless of your print software should have a button that says slice or an option that says slice, something like that. And there is our enclosure. Very nice. And then we can just save it. And I've already saved this a while back, but you're just going to want to save it as a .g code file, and that's what you're going to upload to your printer. Let's go do that now. So when you first get to your printer, you're going to want to preheat the extruder and bed, and if you're printing an ABS, which you should be, you're going to need to heat them pretty hot, so it could take a while. The extruder is going to be faster. Once your printer is hot, go ahead and insert end of your filament. You're going to want to cut the end of it so it's at a 45 degree angle. Just insert, don't, don't ever insert while it's cold. Make sure it's hot. And then you're going to want to hit extrude so that the uh, filament is actually drawn in. And you'll see filament's actually coming out of the nozzle down there, maybe. 
and it's not focusing, but, oh, okay, you can actually see it there, cool. But, uh, go ahead and pull it off once that's done. Close up your printer, and you can get printing. Okay, it started off camera, but what you want to see is you want to see your printer bed homing, which is what it's doing here. So it's just gonna, it's sort of calibrating itself, if you will. Or trying to. Yeah, the preheat temperature was lower than the actual printing temperature, so let's wait for it to warm up and it'll start homing. There it goes. There, just hit the bed. So now it's... And now it's starting to print. You can even watch the progress on the uh, print software if that's available. But yeah. So for the most part, you want to make sure that your first layer goes down okay before leaving your print to do its thing. And to do that, you're going to want to just open your printer. Uh oh. Careful not to burn yourself, but you shouldn't be able to move any part of the laid down print with your finger. If that's good, then you're good. And don't worry, I cleaned up. Once that finishes, you're just going to want to carefully remove it from the printing surface. Then use like a use like a tiny wire cutter, like a diagonal wire cutter, to trim off any excess support material. I don't think there's going to be that much. It's mainly going to be under here. There's probably still some left, but yeah, that's what the box looks like. Now let's move on to soldering the board. And uh, this is not something you have to do yourself. There are lots of places that do this. Even the PCB fabricators will do this. But uh, you don't you don't have to do this yourself. But I'm going to show you how just in case you want to do it yourself. It's it's really quite fun and easy once you get the hang of it. So I'm here in the Maker Lab. Uh, you, you don't have to do this in a lab. You don't need access to a lab. You just I'm just doing it here because it's easier to film. Uh, you, you can do this pretty much anywhere that's well ventilated. You could, you could use your laundry room if that's all you got. But uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is get yourself one of these helping hands tools. These are very handy for soldering wires, soldering boards, all that good stuff. And a little trick I found is if you get some screw, instead of, you could clamp these alligator clips directly to the board itself like you would a wire, but that, that can nick the board, that can peel the silk screen, all kinds of bad stuff, you don't want that. So what I do is I get a set of screws, put them on opposite ends of the board like this, and then just clamp the alligator clips onto that. The board is, well, it's, it's a little bit wiggly, but it doesn't need to be super sturdy for hot air soldering. But, uh... It's not getting nicked, so that is a good thing. So there are two types of soldering that we're going to be doing on this board today. We're going to be doing through hole, which is going to be used for components that are through hole, like you notice these holes here, you can see through them. And hot air soldering, which we're going to be using for the surface mount components, the components that mount directly to the board surface and don't pass through. Of the two, if you've ever soldered wires on your car before, through hole is probably going to be the most familiar, but we're actually going to start with hot air for several reasons. N mainly because a lot of the through hole parts are made of plastic, and if we start, if we apply hot air to any section of the board, that a good portion of the board is going to heat up and you could potentially melt the plastic. I've actually seen that firsthand. So we're going to start with hot air soldering, get those components on first, and then we're going to move to through hole. For hot air soldering, you need what's called solder paste, which comes in a syringe like this. There's a couple caps you need to take off, but you can put the, it's not really a needle, it's not sharp, but put that on and uh, put the plunger in and you're ready to go. You can get solder paste. Here's a part number for some good stuff. You get this from DigiKey when you get your parts. You're going to need a paper towel to clean your solder paste syringe, and you're going to need a source of hot air. This is this is usually recommended. This is uh, meant specifically for this, and it doesn't feel like it's blowing that hot, but whatever. Uh, if you've got a heat gun, that will work too. You're just going to... it might be a little bit harder. I've actually done it with a heat gun before, but uh, you can use that if that's all you got. If you are using a dedicated hot air station, turn it up to like some, something like 275, 276, which should be more than enough for this stuff. It, usually, it is when I use my own heat source, but we're also going to turn on a vent fan, get some ventilation. 
and then we can get started. So when I'm hot air soldering, I like to start with the parts that are gonna be least affected by heat first. So that's the resistors and capacitors. So any part that starts with an R or a C, well, not these parts that start with a C, but any part with a footprint like this that starts with an R or a C. So, and I, and I like to do groups together just because I can. It's easy, saves a lot of time. So I think I'm gonna start with this cluster of R9, R8, C19, and C18. So for that, I'm gonna get my solder paste, make sure there is actually, yeah, you see that silver stuff that's coming out? That's solder paste. What we're gonna do is we're going to get just a dab of paste on each terminal. That's a lot. You don't need to use that much. But just sort of spread it out like that. And then we need to figure out what these components are. And if you've got the uh, BOM or BOM list that I don't like saying bomb in videos, but if you've got the list of parts, you can use that to refer to which parts you need. You can also, and I'll be sure to leave a link for this if I can, you can also look it up in your PCB design software. So we've got R9, R8, C18, and C19. I'm gonna click, nope, that was the net. I'm gonna click R8 here. All right, that's the part number we need to find for R8. Uh, R9, oh look, same part number. And often this will happen if you're soldering groups, you'll get a lot of the same part numbers. And that's a good thing, because you have to find fewer parts, but. <laughs> uh, capacitor, 478, yeah. Capacitors are the same too, so I'm gonna go rummaging through my box of parts and we'll see what we get. Cool, so there's all the parts we need. We're going to just open, and not easy with one hand. We can simply open like that. Empty that out, and yes, these, these are tiny, don't let that scare you, it's, they're really not that bad. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our tweezers here, these come in most electronics kits. And then, let me zoom in here. Then we're just gonna want to grab, you'll see there's plastic covering the components here. Just grab that and peel it back, and we're gonna use two of them, so I'm gonna open two of them. Then you can just dump them, yeah, you see they landed there, so now we're going to want to pick them up with the tweezers and put them on the board. Putting these on the board is as easy as, well, putting them on the board, so uh, it's kind of shaky because I'm right-handed and i got to do that with my left hand because of how the camera angle is, but you're just going to want to sort of get it so that it's approximately where it needs to be, it doesn't need to be perfect, and you'll see why. If you get any solder paste on your tweezers, just wipe it off with a paper towel. I'll do the same for C18. Yeah. Just like that. I've relocated my camera so that I can place these easier, but resistors are exactly the same. You're just going to want to pick them up. Place them. Make sure they're surrounded by paste. And you'll notice if that focuses that I have a bit more than two resistors left. If you're in a situation like that, you're probably gonna be using those later in the design in a different quadrant, so just put them back in the bag and set them aside. Also notice that I'm placing these resistors with the black side up. Uh, sometimes that has text on it that indicates the resistor's value, which is really handy if you drop these or anything like that. But try, try to place them with the text side up if it's got text. All right, with those placed, we can go ahead and heat them. And for that, I'm gonna move the camera. With that, we can go ahead and grab our heat our heat gun, or not really a heat gun. I would say turn the air down to about half, although that doesn't really feel like anything. Okay. All right, so turn the air down just so it's a bit gentler so the resistors and capacitors don't blow off. Then you are going to want to simply hold the heat source over the board just like that. Notice the solder paste is kind of spreading out and bubbling. Once it starts to get a bit... Oh yeah, you see it's bubbling there. That's why we want the heat down. Oh, oh, a component actually flew off. Yeah, that can happen. So, don't panic if it does. Just locate the component. It landed on the base of my helping hands. Pick it up with your tweezers and place it back right where it goes. Yeah, there we go. So, and just keep your heat on it. If you're using a heat gun, you're going to want it at your hottest or 
hottest setting, I'd say. That's what I did. Notice that the paste is kind of uh, tacky now, almost like stucco. Now I'm gonna turn the air up. And you'll see, once the board gets hot, the paste, the solder and the paste will liquefy and pull the components right where they're supposed to go. Yeah, you see it's happening to C19 and C18. That is beautiful. Oh, and you see R9 and R8 shorted together. Don't panic if that happens, just uh, grab your tweezers with your other hand and attempt to separate them. That's a result of using too much solder paste. There we go. Yeah, so once those, once everything looks good, remove the heat source and the solder will dullify as it cools down, just like that. And yeah, they're soldered now. When using hot air like this, it's a good idea to, if you're right-handed like I am, hold the soldering, hold the uh, hot air source in your left hand. So if you need to adjust any components like I just did there, you can hold the tweezers in your right hand and do that. All right, I am gonna do that for the rest of these resistors and capacitors, and I'll get back to you. Little helpful tip, if your board is oriented like this, where the component's vertical, and you gotta place it horizontal, it may be easier to rotate the helping hands that the board is on, and then place it, rather than trying to rotate your tweezers and getting all tangled there. So with all those done, and uh, there is one on the bottom by the way, so you'll have to adjust your board as needed. But with those done, the next thing you're going to want to solder are the surface mount diodes. And this board is kind of a bad example because there are no regular diodes on it. So diodes are indicated by the letter D. Uh, we have D1 there. I think it's just D1 and D2 somewhere else. Where's D2? There's D2. And uh, normally diodes do not have three terminals. They normally have two, like a resistor or capacitor. The one thing to remember about diodes is that they are polarity sensitive, so if you connect it backwards, you're gonna not, the circuit's not gonna work as it should. So all diodes are gonna have a ring or a line on them to indicate the cathode terminal, which is where current flows out of. And on the symbol on the board, there will be a similar line. You're gonna wanna make sure those line up and solder as you would a resistor or capacitor. So make sure it's turned the right way before it solidifies. Another important thing to note is even if the diode itself is the size of one of these res resistors or capacitors, the pads may be a bit smaller, so you may need to move it around with the tweezers a bit before it gets fully locked on, but I'll discuss how to solder these three pad devices when we get to transistors. Those in, the next thing we're gonna wanna solder are the crystals X1, X2, and X3, and they look like this. So these are, once again, gonna be pretty similar to capacitors and resistors, they're just a bit bigger, so you may have to do one terminal at a time. So I'll get the phone mounted and we'll do that. So we're just gonna apply the solder paste as normal. Sorry about all the background noise, there is a wood shop in here. And like, once again, you don't need a lot of it. Little pouch here, just like this. I should probably keep my eye on that, but Oh, and it's out of focus, lovely, but hopefully you get the idea. Place it in the outline, so just like that. And I'm gonna once again grab our heat. I'm gonna use my left hand, so if I need to adjust anything with my right, I can. And let's do down here first. So this isn't gonna be, this isn't gonna be pulled in like the uh, resistors and capacitors work. It's much heavier. 
Yeah, you see that just solidified? Now we want to do the other side, which we're never going to see on camera, so I apologize for that. Whoa, 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 what just happened? Oh, that locked in. Okay. With the shorter terminals like that, you want to make sure that they both kind of lock in like that. Also, note that the base of these crystals are plastic, and they will melt if you leave the heat on them for too long, so try to avoid that as much as possible. There actually wasn't any paste on that terminal, at least none that connected it, so add a little bit more, try it again. There we go. Cool. Alright, those crystals are a bit of a pain, but they're on now. Uh, maybe I should be using through hole from now on, but whatever. Now on to transistors, so that's any component that starts with a Q. So Q1 there, and I think, I think there are two more on this board. But uh, the strategy with these and the three pin diodes, this, this package is known as SOT23 by the way. The strategy here is to get your paste done. One kind of important thing to note is when you're working with transistors is a lot of them are static sensitive, so make sure you ground yourself so you don't have any static on you when you open them and handle them, because they can be fried by static. But once you have them out, you're just going to want to line up with the three terminals like that, just like that. And when you heat, you're going to want to make sure that all three connect, obviously. So, I'm going to get the hose out of the way. So, heat's on now. This one looks like it's behaving itself. And keep an eye on all the terminals to make sure that they all connect. There, you see that one kind of missed. Just nudge it a bit. Oops. Yeah, don't, don't try to move a component if the heat is off, because you could potentially tear the pad on the board. Even worse, lift the trace. That's that's never good. But yeah, oops, wait a minute. Looks like it's okay, but if you look at that upper right terminal, you notice that there's uh there may not be a connection on that. I don't know for sure if there isn't, but if you're in that situation, just add a little bit more solder paste. Give it a bit more heat. Ah, dang it. Let that melt. Yeah, sometimes the ground traces are gonna take a bit longer to heat up because the entire ground is actually a plane on the inside of the board so that's gonna it, it takes obviously it takes longer to heat up because it's bigger but that's that's that with that and we will go ahead and solder the other two another important thing you want to note is you notice that the leads kind of come out of the component and curve you want to make sure that they're curving downward onto the pad not upward because they can still be soldered upward but they're gonna be the wrong polarity, so transistors are obviously polarity sensitive, so make sure the leads are facing downward. The last thing we wanna do before we move on to through hole is the integrated circuits, which is which start with U. Well, usually they start with U, sometimes they start with IC, depends on the board, but here they're gonna start with U. So this is a through hole IC, U2 here. Uh, we're not gonna do that yet. We're gonna do the other ICs, so U1, U7, yada, yada, yada. Um, I would say if it's your first time doing it, start with a fewer number of pins, or start with a lower pin count. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate on U6 here. So we're going to want to just get a very small amount of solder paste across the uh, pins here. Try to spread it out as much as possible, this will help avoid bridges. And make sure that each pin gets connected. Then. We're gonna grab our chip. Now with ICs, there's a lot that could indicate polarity. You notice that on the symbol, we have sort of a notch on top. So if you're looking at it that way, pin number one is gonna be on your top left. So there are lots of ways of doing this. And as you can see on the chip itself, there's actually a little dimple on it. That dimple also indicates pin one. So we wanna line it up so the dimple and notch are on the same side, like that. And some, sometimes the dimple's drawn in, and sometimes you even have a... Sometimes the edge of the IC is actually cut, and I'll show that if I've got an IC like that. But if you notice on U7 up here, we have a dot to indicate pin number one. And uh, what's on the board isn't always going to match what's on the tip, but... It's pretty much the same strategy as the transistor. Get your heat source. Hold it over, try to hold it, if you're using a heat gun especially, try to hold it at a 90 degree angle and make sure if the, this one you want to make sure it doesn't shift around as much because you don't want the wrong pins connecting. But we're just going to warm it. There you see we're solidifying already. 
And there you see it centered and it looks like they all connected. And when that finishes, you just want to inspect and make sure there are no bridges between terminals. I don't see any. That would just be the solder connecting multiple terminals at once. And you also want to make sure that all terminals are connected. So if, if it's like a smooth ramp up, then it's good. And you see on number seven there, it's, it's kind of steep maybe. I think it connected, I don't know for sure. It connected, but you're looking for something like that, but weaker, so there's not as much solder. If a bridge happens, you're gonna wanna, as the chip is being heated, get your tweezers in here and just sort of push the extra solder away so that the two pins disconnect. You probably put too much paste on. You see, I put too much paste on here. That would have been a bridge had we done it here. And if one of the pins is not connected, just get a very small amount of solder paste and reheat. Here's a situation where we need to add more solder paste. You notice the bottom of the pin doesn't really have any solder on it. That's gonna make for a very poor connection, so get some paste on there and reheat. And I'll show you here that this chip not only has a dimple in the top left, but you notice that there's a bit of a, the, uh, the left side is not completely straight. There's a bit of a chamfer there. That also indicates the row of pins that has number one on it, so that should be on the left with respect to the notch on the board. A couple more things to note with ICs is that some of them have a large pad that is normally used for heat sinking or ground, like this one right here, U1. You're gonna wanna apply paste to that as well. Sometimes it's under the entire IC. Another thing to note, notice C4 and C2, how close they are to U1. As you're heating U1, you can actually, and most likely will, heat up the solder joints for C2 and C4. So if, you're, if you have to use the tweezers at all, be very careful not to dislodge them. So with that done, I think we're ready to start the through-hole contact soldering. So if you've got an iron like this, that, that is great. Uh, you don't want to use the gigantic solder gun that you might be using for car wiring. Uh, you're going to need that. You're going to need your solder. And I would recommend getting one of these little brass filings containers. This, is, this acts as sort of a sponge to clean the iron tip. You can do this with a wet sponge, but I, I found that that can corrode the iron tip a bit faster. And the first thing you want to do when your iron's warm is stab a little bit of solder on it, like that. And clean it off in your filings. You notice that the tip is nice and shiny. This is known as tinning, and, you, and you're going to want to do it after each component. So I've turned the board upside down. You're going to want to maybe loosen it so it can flex a bit so you know where the parts need to go. And uh, I think we're gonna start with C1 down there. So we'll grab that. Now the surface mount capacitors we were doing earlier are ceramic. They're not polarity sensitive, but these are electrolytic and they most likely are. So what you wanna do is you want to look for the longer and shorter lead and you want the longer lead to go into the positive hole or the one that's not marked here. And uh, if the leads are for whatever reason the same length, just look for this negative marking that needs to go into the non-positive mark. Do you see how there's like marking here? And you just wanna get both leads of the capacitor in there, push it so that it's almost flush. And I've found that if you bend the leads outward like this, it holds the capacitor in a bit better. With those in, something I might recommend is that you push the component up from the bottom so that it's flush get a dab of solder on one of these leads and then just solder the rest normally and I'm gonna do that so I got my iron I'm gonna get a dab of solder on it hold it up do this only if you're comfortable because this is obviously kind of hot ah damn it but this is just like a tack solder yeah you see how that's a bit sturdier so what we want to do if we're soldering the full joint is we want to touch both the helps at the tips lighted. We want to touch both the component leg and the pad with the iron so they both warm up. And then we want to insert the solder sort of in between them. See that it kind of formed a conical shape there? And we'll just do this with the other side. Like that. Uh, sometimes it'll, ow, sometimes it'll get on the lead. Just like that. With that done, you're just going to want to grab a small cutting tool like this, cut the leads off, and it's in. Let's do U2 next, but we're not gonna solder in the IC itself. We're gonna solder in the socket for it so we can remove it whenever we need to. 
Uh, notice that the socket has, if I can focus on it, notice that the socket has a notch, and you'll notice that the silk screen symbol also has a notch. I want to line those up. It's not easy because I'm filming and I'm at an angle, but once you get it in, it should kind of hold itself in. If it doesn't, you can hold it and do the tack soldering done earlier. But then, this is going to be cool, you're going to simply careful not to burn yourself, obviously, and if I didn't mention this at the beginning of the video, wear safety goggles when you do this. If you just heat up the pad or the lead, it'll create what's called a cold solder joint, and that's, you don't want that. If you're noticing that your iron tip is starting to dull out, add a little bit of solder to it, clean it off, good as new. Boom. Connectors are going to be pretty much the same. They just kind of snap in and then you can solder them easily. Note that they're polarity sensitive too, obviously. So, dang it. Focus. So you notice that the uh, silk screen has a bit of a notch here. You want to line it up with the notch on the connector. So I sort of screwed up with J1 here and didn't provide a good polarity marking. Uh, you, want, you want to orient it so that the latch side, so the side with all the protrusions here, is facing, is opposite that of the right angle connector. So. If, if we have it in the car, we're gonna be ha we're gonna have it oriented like this. You want to turn the climate control, the stock climate control connector, up, not around. So with this, because the climate control connector plugs in from the back, you'll just turn it up and it'll plug in. And with that one in, you're just about done. I'm gonna clean up the lab now, bring this home, and we'll program it. Awesome. The last thing we need to do electronics-wise is program the microcontroller. Um, that's really easy, you just need a breadboard, a couple of components, that's a 16 megahertz crystal, two 22 picofarad capacitors, a 1 kilo ohm resistor, a bunch of Arduino jumpers, and I will be sure to leave links to all of this in the description. A breadboard with ignore all this crap, this is just for other projects, and an Arduino Uno. I think the other Arduinos will work as well, but if you got the Uno, that's good, because it's the same chip that's in the Uno. So you're going to want to download and open your Arduino IDE. Uh, it's totally free, I'll leave a link to that as well. Very easy to get. And then you're going to want to go to File, Examples, Arduino ISP, and then just select Arduino ISP. Uh, plug your Arduino Uno into your computer via USB cable. And I'll put a picture of how this needs to be wired from Arduino's website. But with that all connected, you're going to want to, with your Arduino plugged in, you want to make sure you have the correct board selected, in this case an Arduino Uno. You're going to want to hit upload here. There it goes. Uploading, 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 done uploading. All right, so now this is ready to burn the bootloader, and you only, you only need to burn the bootloader once. Once you've done this, you can do all the remaining programming on the board we just built. You see there are headers that I forgot to label. Son of a bitch, okay. Well, this, this, won't be, this may not be the final board that you get, but yeah, I'll be sure to do that next time. <laughs> so once that's done, you're going to want to come up to Tools here. We need to go to Tools, Programmer, Arduino is ISP. Now we can go to Tools, Burn Bootloader, Burning Bootloader. So it's doing that. Done Burning Bootloader. And we're done. You can simply unplug your Arduino. Remove your chip from the breadboard. That requires two hands. Be careful not to bend any of the leads on the chip when doing this. Then you can simply pop it into the socket we soldered earlier. Uh, once again, paying attention to the location of the notch. Make sure notch on top, notch on top. So here's how you're gonna wanna wire this for programming. And once again, I apologize for not leaving silkscreen text here. That will be corrected, don't worry. Anyway, you're gonna need your Arduino Uno. Uh, remove the chip from it because you're gonna be, you're not gonna wanna program the chip here, you're gonna wanna program the chip here. And the four connections you need to make are as follows. Looking at the header with the chip facing upward with the notch on top, the lowest pin on the header is your ground, so you're gonna wanna connect that to any of the ground ports on the Arduino Uno. Next up is TX, and I'll be sure to leave a picture of this as well. Next up is TX, you want to connect that to your Arduino's TX pin, you can see white wire TX. Next up is RX, receiving, that goes to RX on the Arduino, you can see there. And then the one on top is reset, so you'll want to connect that to the pin labeled reset on your Arduino Uno. Very easy, once again there will be pictures all over the place.
To power the chip as it's being programmed, you can either plug it into the car when with the car and accessory two, and bring your laptop out to the car with the Arduino and connect the header on front, or you can use a 12 volt power supply like my homemade one there, and connect positive to pin number 17, so that's the lowest right, and then two pins to the left of that, 19, connect ground. Then you're going to want to load the provided auto climate can filter file into your Arduino ID. Once again, make sure you've got the correct board selected. Hit upload, compiling sketch, uploading, and you notice we have activity lights down there. Well, we did. But and then it says done uploading. That's good. That means we were uploaded successfully, everything is working, and the bootloader, bootloader was burned successfully. And if you need to program this again, you don't need to burn the bootloader again. You just need to make these connections and re-upload the program. Very easy. Before we install this in the car, why don't we just discuss the uh, connectors quickly and where they need to go. So starting with J1 on the bottom of the board, this is the big guy. This is the exact same connector that both the manual and automatic climate control units use. So you'll just plug your manual harness into that. It's all plug and play. Uh, J2 up here, which is upside down. There's J2. It's on the side. This connects to your illumination positive and negative. You don't need to connect it to anything. This is just so if you add an accessory that requires illumination, you can plug it in here very easily. You won't need to splice anything or anything like that. J5 is your connection to your automatic climate control unit, and you can make a little adapter for that. It's very easy. Each pin sort of lines up with its match on the connector that's going to go into the auto climate control. So you'll just be able to go straight across, plug this in, plug this end into your auto climate control, and you're good. J4 is this one right here. It's directly underneath J2 and J1. This is what's going to connect to your interior temperature sensor, sensor, which is built into your climate control, and that is wired as shown here. Here's a map of the entire bottom of the black box. I'll link all connector pinouts in the description so you can reference them while you're working on this. J6 is what's going to plug into your car's CAN bus, so you're going to connect it to BCANH and BCANL, and your climate control will be able to receive messages from the car, like the outside temp. And finally, J7, that's the one we're using. We're just using that for programming. That will not connect to anything in the car. It's just there because, well, we got to program the chip somehow, and we don't want to have to keep taking it off and putting it back on. But yeah. So with that, I think we are ready to go ahead and put this in the car. Over to you, Zach. All right, so here we are. First, I'm going to cover disassembly. Then I'll briefly cover the wiring. And then reassembly is basically just the reverse of assembly. So it's pretty straightforward. I've already had this in here to test it, and it does work, so that's awesome. Essentially what you're gonna do though, come down here, open this, take whatever you got out of here, and then there are two Phillips head screws right there that you need to remove. Next, firmly but carefully grab kind of like this, just sort of pull like that, and this trim piece is gonna come out of here like so. Next, you need to remove that Phillips head screw and that one there on the left, but not this one. All right, and then ignoring this, this will come later. This is part of the conversion. There is a security screw right back here, one over there, and those hold in the head unit for the radio. All right, next pull the radio out, but not all the way, because you still got to reach back there to disconnect the manual climate control in the car beforehand, which should just be reaching up back there, pulling out the tab. And then same deal with your hazard light. And then the radio has about 10 different connections. But once you get the screws out from underneath and pop this forward, it's pretty easy to get at the connectors for these from the backside. All right, with the radio out, now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take these four screws right here out to swap over the climate control unit. And then it is easier, I found, if you kind of pry the bottom a little bit gently. You can see how it pries, but it is a little fragile. Pry that down a little bit, then you can kind of shimmy this out at an angle. You kind of have to shimmy it in and out. It's a little bit of a tight fit over here on the side with the smaller knob. However, it will fit. Just take your time and have some patience and you can bend this a little bit. But yeah, swap the two over, get it here, and then put the adapter from the auto climate 
to the Molex and the auto climate, and then get the interior temperature sensor to the conversion board plugged in as well. All right, now you wanna unlock the steering column, come over here and pop out. Should be a few of them. All of the clips holding this front panel on. There's one more here. Sometimes it can be easier if you come at it from the side. There we go. Then this will come out of the way. And then you want to come over here and then just same deal, kind of pop this. Just be gentle. There we go. Then just make sure to unplug your traction control switch. All right, and then finally you want to come over here and then same deal, pop right there and right there. And then you'll get this trim piece out and then same deal, unplug your engine start button. And then when removing the engine start button or the lower trim panels, uh, it can be helpful, you know, make sure you have the column unlocked so you can telescope it out and down. That's very uh, helpful in particular when removing the speedometer or the tachometer trim bezel. Moving on from that, you'll want to pull that Phillips head screw and this Phillips head screw down here. That one can stay. All right, I'm going to need two hands to do this, but it's helpful to open the door. Essentially, with those screws removed, you just lift this whole thing up. And I'm going to need two hands, but I mean, you'll see in a minute, but literally this the whole piece will come out. You just sort of reach around over here. You start to pop it up, but you really need two hands. So give me a sec. All right. I have already run the wiring, so I probably will not pull the tachometer and speedometer and iMid screen. However, it will really help to run and zip tire the wiring back underneath here. So in order to do so, just pull this screw, that Phillips head screw down there, as well as that Phillips head screw, and then the tachometer will come out. It just unplugs from the back. And then you have one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven Phillips head screws. Uh, for getting to some of these back ones, it's really helpful to have a uh, right angle screwdriver or a uh, like a three quarter, uh, three eighths or a quarter inch drive socket that can have a screwdriver in it. Just something where you can get that right angle torque on it because it's, you know, there's not a lot of space right here. Uh, maybe a stubby screwdriver could do it, but I'm not 100% sure. Also getting this thing in and out is pretty easy. You just snap it in like so. Then to get it out, you just kind of reach in under here. Sort of got a fun bowl around, but when you feel it, pop right up. All right, so here I'm gonna go over how to create the wiring harness for a normal wiper style, you know, non-automatic, you haven't done the auto wiper conversion. And I'm just gonna go over a brief explanation of the wiring pinouts and the connectors you'll need. I'm not gonna go over how to crimp the wires here. Um, Aiden has a great video on how to do that, so we'll link that down below. All right, so the four connectors you're gonna need are gonna be the MX34007, both a male and a female, and then you're gonna need an XHP-2 female and a PAP-04V-S female. Um, and then I would like to note that all of the female connectors are gonna be tab up in this image, just for ease of wiring, so there's no confusion. And then I also wanna note that even though the factory light sensor does have a seven pin connector on it on the non auto climate cars. Uh, the non auto climate cars only have a five pin or a five wire harness. Um, the pin out of the five wire harness is gonna be the BCAN network low, BCAN network high, uh, lights on signal, which is just grounded when you turn your headlights on on the turn signal stock, uh, ground and then a 12 volt power. All right, so the wiring harness you need to build is going to jumper in the EXL light sensor whilst extracting canvas data and the sunlight output from the sensor. You need to wire up can low, can high, lights on, ground, and 12 volt power to the EXL sensor so that it can function as normal and communicate with the car. And then send the can low and can high as well as the sun A and uh, sensor comm outputs to the auto climate box.
I do want to just briefly mention that you're going to have to get an EXL light sensor for the system to work. Uh, the factory light sensor, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, it only has the five wires. Uh, because the cars didn't come with automatic climate, I don't believe they came with the sensor required to run it. And so uh, when I tried to connect the stock sensor up to the climate, it didn't work, it wouldn't communicate. So you will need to get an EXL light sensor in order for the system to work. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna talk about the uh, wiring harness you're gonna need to make for the automatic wipers now. Also, for those of you who didn't know, the ninth generation Honda Civic shipped with everything that it needed from the factory to support uh, factory automatic wipers. And so if you just disconnect the stock light sensor and hook in one for automatic wipers, you'll have automatic wipers all of a sudden. Aiden has a great DIY if you're interested and the videos can be found on the main page of the channel. If you're doing the swap and you already have the automatic wipers installed, you'll probably already have the stock harness connector, the male MX-34007 connector, as well as the female MX-34005 connector to hook into the auto wiper sensor. So you'll just need to source the MX-34007 female, as well as the XHP-2 female and the PAP-04V-S female. Really not much needs to change with this setup. Um, all you need to do is take the wiring from the auto wiper sensor and tap into the can low and can high and send it to the auto climate box. And then uh, run wiring to extract the sun A and sensor comm outputs and wire those into the auto climate box as well. The automatic climate control actually is going to be able to power the sunlight sensor. So these two wires are all you're gonna need to power the sunlight sensor, just sun A and sensor comm. One quick side note, uh, with the automatic wipers, the lights on wire doesn't need to connect to anything. Um, we're not really sure why Honda has it unless the factory sensor doesn't work correctly without it. So if you're going to be using the normal wipers and have the normal EXL sensor controlling your headlights, we recommend wiring it in. However, if you have the automatic wipers, uh, there's actually no place to wire it. So you do not need to wire it anywhere. Don't worry about it. Uh, I don't have it wired to anything and the headlights work totally fine. Also, because I have the automatic wiper mod done to my car, uh, this is how the wiring is going to look for me and this is how the wiring is going to appear in the car. Um, I will have just the two wires going to the sunlight sensor um, and then there'll be a tap and a split for the CAN bus from the automatic wiper sensor. One thing I do want to mention is that these diagrams, uh, whether you have normal wipers or auto wipers, are going to be only for cars that have automatic headlights. If you don't have automatic headlights, there's not going to be a factory light sensor to tap the CAN bus, and so you're going to have to tap the CAN bus behind the radio instead. More information on how to tap the CAN bus behind the radio can be found on the automatic wiper conversion for non-auto headlight cars, uh, and that video can be found on the main page of the channel. Essentially though, you're going to be looking for a pink wire and a blue wire on the same connector. Uh, B can high is going to be pink and B can low is going to be blue. Then what you need to do is you need to take those two wires and then run them into the XHP-2 connector uh, to get CAN bus into the auto climate box. And then you'll need to take the uh, Sun A and sensor comm wires and it'll look similar to the auto wiper harness uh, and run those to the EXL light sensor. I do want to circle back up here for just one moment. Um, this connector right here is not really available without, you know, you have to have it for like soldering to a board. So what I did is I used a female Arduino header, just chopped that off and spliced onto it. And those snap in pretty good onto this. And I've had it for, you know, over 10,000, you know, probably 15,000 miles now. And I haven't had any communication issues, any of these popping off, anything like that. It doesn't seem to rattle or make any loud vibrating noises. So I'm pretty satisfied with this setup. Then when wiring all of this up, uh, getting the appropriate length of wire, there's a pretty easy trick for that. Aiden's explained it in the past, but essentially get a little slack up here or wherever you would wish to start, if you want to start down there and then run your wire right here and then cut it, just, just do one. Then what you can do is take that singular length of wire and then use that as a reference for your other three so you don't have to fish, you know, three lengths of wire to get approximate, or excuse me, four lengths of wire. You don't have to do it three more times in order to get all your lengths of wire set up. You can just do one, cut it, 
cut the three other lengths and I would highly, highly recommend that you use different colors because, you know, what happens if there's a problem? There. Then you take this tape off. You're not gonna know if you're using all red wires. Oh, which one is the problematic wire? You're not gonna know which wire to test on. So yeah, highly would recommend using different colors for that as well. All right, so now that you got the lengths of wire cut, hopefully, you know, get them taped up, get your different connectors on here. This one here is for the daylight sensor. It's a four pin Molex. And then this is a two pin Molex for the CAN bus. And then, you know, you got your CAN bus connection right here. And then this is going to be, like I said, your sensor output and power for this sensor right up here, the JE terminal. Essentially, what you need to do now is, since the wiring harness is completed, zip tie it. I would recommend there's a factory wiring harness that runs right up along here. Zip tie it to that and run it on through. All right, one thing to make note of that's really important when running the wire, you can see how there's the factory bundle that's going up into the steering column. You can see how there's a steering shaft and all sorts of stuff going on under here. You do not want the wire to be too low. You wanna make sure that when you're running this thing, you can see it. It is that one there. I made sure I was running it up along that top support where the factory wiring is running because you do not want it to get stuck up in that steering intermediate shaft or anywhere along in the pedal box. Uh, that could be a serious drivability concern, you know, could cause an accident. You really want to make sure that you run that thing up out of the way. Now I was able to run it up and over, and then you can see once I cleared the steering box, I'm able to come back down off the main frame. You can see I'm running next to the mains electrics, and then we come out around up and over there. All right. Now that all that's installed, you basically just got to slap everything back in in reverse order. Get your top panel. Well, if you removed your gauges, put your gauges back in. Make sure your wiring and everything is all secured. Plug back in. Make sure you screw them all down. Then get your top panel back on. Then get your gauge trim piece, your side panel, your head unit, and then put this guy back, your kick panel. So I'm going to do that real quick. All right, so one thing I did wait on the head unit. Um, I just wanted to go over actually connecting up the box really quickly. Uh, it'll be easier to do that with it kind of all out in the open here. Uh, so essentially, this guy right here is your in for the manual harness. So this is our manual harness that's gonna plug into this guy right here. This connector is then for the interior temperature sensor that four pronger on there. This goes out to the auto climate unit through the Molex. This guy is our four pin right here to the daylight sensor. And then our CAN bus is gonna be this two pronger right here. This two pronger is for an illumination circuit, uh, just for future proofing, you know, figured uh, you can easily just pull from the illumination circuit of the climate control. And then now you have illumination control for gauges or what have you in the future. Just run it from right in here. But yeah, I'm gonna plug this in, just kind of show you how it'll sorta of sit in there. And then I'm gonna throw the radio in. Okay, so I got it plugged up, except for, you know, those two right here, those will plug into the auto climate unit and then those just run, you know, right here respectively. But yeah, I found it easiest where you kind of have it sort of sit up like this and then you can sort of see how the wires will hang down. Uh, I made sure to zip tie the wires right here because otherwise uh, this door that opens and closes has this sort of catch arm thing. And so that when that's swinging up and down, if you don't make sure to zip tie the wires over off to the side uh, for your daylight and your CAN bus, they might get entangled. But apart from that, yeah, just right up there. Then I ran the er, manual climate harness right here, just kind of around behind. 
All right, so lastly, just take your automatic climate unit or your aspirator. They are the same size uh, tube end. To the hardware store, grab a foot, 18 inches of vinyl tubing. I think it was a 3 8 inch inner diameter tube. And uh, yeah, that's what I use to connect the interior temperature sensor to the aspirator. Uh, how I did that, how the easiest way to do that I found was before you slap the radio in and before you screw it all the way down, leave it out about an inch and a half, fish the tube from up here down to your aspirator, and then pinch the tube, the end of the tube, and sort of like kind of force it, pinch, and then shove towards you so that it puts it onto the end of your interior temperature sensor. Then, once it's on the end of your interior temperature sensor, you can push the radio all the way back in and then go down to the footwell and finish running and hooking it up to the aspirator. All right, and so the last part of this whole assembly here is the aspirator, and that would be that white piece of plastic right up there. And essentially, what this thing does is it will take airflow from in the box, uh, inside the air box, and it exits out through the little cone shape right here, and as it exits out, it creates a suction on the vinyl hose on this end right here. And uh, that suction is then used by the interior air temperature sensor to create uh, or to get an accurate interior temperature reading. Unfortunately, the port for the aspirator is plugged on non-automatic uh, climate models because you don't need an aspirator for uh, manual climate. And so... I found it was easiest, come over here, take a drill, the right angle attachment and a drill bit, and then just uh, get up in there, hold this with two hands, and then just make a whole bunch of holes. Just go around in a circle, just and then as, the plastic's really soft, so as I drilled it through, then as it got, uh, you know, smaller and smaller in between each segment i was then able to just take the drill bit and just kind of go around like a router and knock all of those little plastic uh, splines out that i had created in order to prevent the piece of plastic that's plugging the aspirator from falling into the air box uh leave one spline and then break that spline by grabbing it with a pair of pliers and pulling the plug out um, and then use the drill bit to shave the edges down and then you need to remove pretty much all of the plastic material that's in there. You can't leave any because the aspirator, as you can see, is a little difficult, but it's got little clips in there. Those clips clip into the air box behind, essentially it clips behind where the plastic material is. So you need to make sure you knock all of the plastic material out of the plug and then clip your aspirator in. One thing I forgot to mention here is that the aspirator has a blend door that lives right behind it. Uh, it's the blend door for the two center vents in the dash. So to deal with this and make sure it's closed, start the car or put it into run and then select the defroster and then uh, wait for the air to be fully coming out of the defroster vents and for the two center vents in the dash to have no airflow. And then at that point you should be good to shut off the car and then drill out the aspirator plug. But yeah, once you do that, you'll get the suction and you can connect the uh, hose to it. One final thing, I found it very helpful to remove the uh, wiring from the amplifier and just tuck it up out of the way. And same deal for uh, the actuator motor right here for a blend door. Uh, just, just disconnect them. It's really easy just to pop these loose. Just get them out of the way. All right, now come over here, put the car into run, don't start it. And then you just wanna make sure, yup, our fan is working, we got a number. And then it'll be probably really hard for you to hear it, but you can uh, in person hear that the rear defogger relay is clicking on and off. So that's good. So we're going to shut the car off. Now, while holding automatic and recirc, you're going to do the same thing and put the car into run. All right. So we're now in the automatic climate diagnostic menu. 
One thing I forgot to mention here is that uh, even though the automatic climate control unit displays the desired temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, the actual diagnostic menu is all going to be in degrees Celsius. So anytime there's a temperature value, it's all going to be in degrees C. To get here, like I said, push and hold down auto and uh, recirc at the same time while putting the car into run. Pull this up and then we're just going to cycle through, make sure there's no errors with uh, blend door or getting a temperature reading. And so we're gonna cycle through our values with the rear defogger button here. So number one is the uh, blend door for the mode switch. So as we switch our mode, we can see the value changes. So we're good. Two, we have a reading for our interior temperature. So that's good. Three is exterior temperature, good. Four is the daylight sensor, so good. Five is the evaporator temperature, so that's good. Six is the uh, cold hot blend door so that's good and then seven is the recirc blend door yep that's good and then if any of these have a problem it would say error too it would be flashing seven error seven error but since it's not we're doing good number eight is vehicle speed looks good nine is coolant temperature that looks good then a is the desired uh, vent temperature and B is our humidity. That all looks good. All right, and lastly, we get to the C menu. In the uh, regular Civic, without the hybrid system, uh, you would just have the software version. It should say C, and then flash a number, and then have the fan lines. However, uh, if you have a Civic hybrid, you have two air conditioning compressors. You have an air conditioner, or uh, electric air conditioner, and a gasoline air conditioner, and so, uh, this has to sort of blend the two together, and so there's a few different menus in there for that. Uh, Aiden has a different video on the channel about it, so I won't go too in-depth in it here. However, uh, if you're seeing menus D and E, uh, it means that you more than likely have the hybrid climate control unit, and that won't be compatible here. All right, yeah, it's later. I took a break, but got the head unit, all this installed plugged in here and the last thing is just get them two screws in there and then be careful when you're reinstalling your little cubby here but yeah get the screws in right here and then just be careful putting the cubby in and then put the last two screws right there all right and that's it automatic climate conversion has been completed thank you for watching